So you're all very welcome uh, to Food Sovereignty, Climate Action and Local Resilience. Uh, this is a Green European Foundation event, uh, and it's part of a project uh, that is looking at producing a pamphlet uh, on the topic later this year, and is building on our question of scale paper, the project we did last year with GEF, um, looking at uh, shortening supply chains and local economies. Today, we're going to just, uh, I'll give you a quick overview of the, the session. Uh, so I'm going to just give a bit of context, then we'll have a welcome from GF and GFI. Uh, we'll do an overview of the paper we're working on. Fergal will be given an overview. Uh, and then we have uh, some reflections from a European perspective. And then we have three local stories, sort of looking at a framing of uh, food sovereignty in three different aspects here in Ireland. And then we're going to have a breakout looking at the blockers and enablers in small groups in four areas. We're really uh, going into the trying to harvest some insights from those conversations before we close. So today we're engaging in conversations uh, with advocates of regenerative agriculture, with rural regeneration and sustainable communities. And we're exploring how we might strengthen the resilience and well-being of our local places through the framing of food sovereignty. So we're, oh, yeah. we're going to uh, just have a couple yes. of welcomes. Um, so my name is Seen. I'm a project coordinator at the Green European Foundation. Yeah, um, so we're <laughs> organizing today's event with the support of Green Foundation Ireland and Cultivate. Um, for those of you who might not know us, the Green European Foundation is a European level political foundation. Um, so we're funded by the European Parliament and affiliated to, but independent of um, the European Greens. Um, and our mission is really to contribute to kind of the development of a European public sphere, um, get citizens more involved in EU level politics, build a stronger, more participative democracy. Um, as you know, agriculture is something that on the European level is um, quite an important topic, um, especially these days. Um, and so we also really like having these events more at the local level um, where we can really harvest um, local okay, and, um, and national actors input and bridge that gap to Brussels. Yeah, so one of our projects this year is a, uh, a so-called transnational project, which is really where we bring together um, foundations from across Europe. So this one's called Climate Emergency Economy. Um, and we have partners from Ireland, but also from the UK, Bulgaria, um, and the Netherlands. And particularly on agriculture, we're really hoping to connect um, some of the perspectives from Ireland and Bulgaria, so two very different parts of Europe. Um, and yeah, uh, the project itself looks into the challenges of building a so-called climate emergency economy, focusing on certain hard to reach uh, sectors of which agriculture is one. So we're really excited um, to share this first draft of the, of the paper and some of the enablers and blockers that have been identified and uh, yeah, to build on this uh, discussion. Um, and if you want to stay in touch with the project, also the future events that will be happening with our uh, Bulgarian partners, I will drop a link in the chat um, that you can subscribe to our newsletter and uh, yeah, hopefully we stay in touch. Okay, thank you for that, Sian. And just from GFI, the Green Foundation of Ireland, who are a partner in this project, uh, Tommy Simpson, just to say a few words of welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, this is uh, one of a series, as uh, Sian has just mentioned. Uh, the lead partner on this is Greenhouse in the UK, and thanks to Peter Sims and Jonathan Essex. But uh, again, it's 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 a follow-on also from last year. What uh, Davy mentioned, uh, a question of scale. Uh, we've been running projects now in collaboration with Cultivate for some years, uh, on and off. And I have to say, uh, Cultivate have been an excellent partner. And I would ask urge individuals to take a look at the publication from last year, a question of scale, which is available on the Green Foundation Ireland website. We've also run a number of other seminars uh, prior to COVID, um, going back right to 1914. And my main emphasis has been on the whole area of sustainable jobs. We ran uh, the one called Rebuilding Communities Through Sustainable Jobs. That
14, uh, sustainable community, sustainable jobs. That was in the DCU in, in Dublin City University. Um, also, uh, one in Clock Jordan, which uh, Davy again collaborated on, was uh, the, the full circle, it was called, a community approach to sustainable work. Uh, and then we had uh, one on food as well, which Oliver uh, Moore also spoke at, was in UCC in Cork, University of Cork, restoring food to the heart of the community and, and, and so on. And then in 2018, jobs in a changing climate. That was with the trade union SIP2 uh, and uh, giant climate jobs and the just transition that was in Queen's University in Belfast and as I mentioned last year question of scale so we uh, we continue to collaborate with um, Cultivate and it's been an excellent experience and I would urge people to look up the uh, publications and uh, other information on the Green Foundation Ireland website thank you so thanks for that, Tommy, and thanks for Green Foundation Ireland's support, along with Green European Foundation for this webinar and for this wider project. So this webinar builds upon a context article that we've been developing uh, with Fergal Anderson called Food Sovereignty, Climate Action and Local Resilience. Uh, this will be published later this year. Fergal is a small farmer with Talib Bio, uh, he, the Irish Land Workers Alliance, and is formerly with Via Campesina. And uh, so over to you, Fergal. Uh, yeah, my name is Fergal. So uh, we have a farm here in the west of Ireland. Uh, it's about, I suppose, uh, 10 hectares in total. Uh, we've got two he hectares of uh, mixed vegetables and horticulture orchards. And uh, we, we manage about eight hectares of uh, mixed woodland. Um, we market everything direct into local markets. We've done different things over the years, uh, selling in the local market on the street, uh, running communities for agriculture. Um, project and at the moment we're, we're mostly uh, working with a couple of restaurants we have a very good relationship with those restaurants but so Davey asked me to, to, to write up this document and you've all received it uh, I think so I'm not going to go through it point to point because that would just be painful I think uh, but maybe I can sort of think about we can talk a little bit about some of the concepts which would have informed the thinking around it um, and maybe go into a little bit more uh, possible things that we can reflect on uh, as we as we enter the discussion so I mean, firstly, I suppose food sovereignty, um, that's a global framework for thinking about food and agriculture, uh, which we can use to better understand the kind of issues that we're facing. And I think um, it's based on these principles of solidarity and social justice and agroecology. And I'm putting farmers and citizens at the center of discussions uh, about rather than agribusiness uh, corporations. And a second element that's in the paper is obviously climate change. And I think we need to remember as we have these discussions that the real cause of climate change is an economic model based on that endless growth uh, on speculative financial markets and on an attitude towards our natural world, which is more or less uh, based on extraction or in the case of agriculture uh, on an almost, what you could call an antagonistic relationship to the natural world rather than a cooperative one. Um, and it's that neoliberal market-led approach of capitalism, which continues to try and convince us that there is no alternative uh, possible. And it expends a huge amount of energy in attempting to eliminate or discredit, or actually particularly, I think, absorb any alternatives which emerge to that model. So I think there's a danger in general of approaching climate change with the same mentality as that which created it, which uh, wants to only develop more markets, uh, more extractive industries, and more opportunities to continue a kind of accumulation and an application of industrial and technological solutions and systems to all walks of life. And as we know, I mean, agriculture and land use is a huge player in, in climate change, not just in terms of emissions, but uh, more worryingly, maybe the main player in the kind, of, uh, the kind of catastrophic biodiversity loss that we're seeing almost everywhere, and in the broken carbon and water cycles, which are inhibiting the capacity of the planet to regulate its own natural processes. So when we're confronted with those global problems, it's, it's, it's often very difficult to find common solutions. And that's why I think the concept of food sovereignty is so key here. It gives us a, a framework for thinking about how we interact with our land, uh, within our communities, um, with each other, which is debated at a, you know, from a local to a global level. And it's discussed and debated with the same understanding from one end of the earth to, to the other. And from back home to Brazil or Mozambique to Madrid, wherever it might be. Um, and we're very lucky to have a concept like that, which tackles global issues in a common way. And it's thanks to La Via Campesina for that concept. 
Uh, it's thanks to the peasants of the world for bringing that idea into the, the, the kind of discussion uh, more than 25 years ago now. And it kind of brings us to where we are today, where food sovereignty remains this unfinished and constantly evolving concept, um, which has been used by social movements, debated by social movements for more than 25 years. And as such, it can't really be eliminated, it can't be discredited, and it can't be absorbed uh, by that neoliberal model. And I think that is why it offers us such a, you know, such a useful possibility to confront the neoliberal model from the places where we're strongest, uh, which is our fields and our farms, in our case, um, where we still have some degree of autonomy from, from that system. And that, that said, that, that autonomy has been eroded on many farms. Uh, farmers who are selling to global markets find themselves in the situation where they're dependent on agribusiness corporations for the purchase of inputs. Uh, they're dependent on them for the, the industrial machines that they use. Uh, and they're constantly being sold new technologies and new systems. And we're seeing that system of production receive the lion's share of subsidies um, where public money is essentially being used to ensure markets for agribusiness corporations to provide those inputs uh, and both in supply of inputs and also in terms of the to ensure cheap outputs that they can then process and uh, sell and trade on global markets. And I mean, if, as if that's not enough, the, those farming systems also have hugely negative impacts on our on actual world, on biodiversity, on water quality, on an ecosystem. So, I mean, in Ireland, this applies in particular to something like our dairy industry, where we export more than 90% of our production at a huge environmental cost, um, but also at, at a social cost. Because I think, I mean, the industrialization of farming and, and the conversion to agribusiness uh, operations, uh, I don't even call them farms in some of those places, it disconnects these farms from their regions, from their localities, and it creates a, a kind of monoculture of production rather than a polyculture. And it also creates a monoculture of farm type. So it threatens the existence of the very kind of small scale diversified farming that we need now more than ever to confront the challenges with which we're faced. And I think citizens are beginning to ask those questions. They're asking, beginning to ask you know, how public money has been spent, uh, why it is being used in, to create damage, to create harm. Um, and to benefit a, a minority of agribusiness shareholders. Um, and farmers are organizing as well. And I think it's maybe through that kind of collective social movements of farmers and citizens that we'll see the capacity building to confront the vested, vested interests of agribusinesses because uh, there's no doubt that they're kind of powerful opponents. Anyway, so the, the, the paper is broken into these four sections, which we have production, distribution, livelihoods and labor, and global trade and solidarity. And I think in the first two areas, we've got like a very rich lived experience in Europe of examples of ag agroecological production, um, uh, of, which is working on the ground, and examples of very well organized sort of community led distribution systems. Um, and what those systems lack and what those productions lack uh, very often are policies and supports which would go towards and sort of making it easier and less uh, inhibited for them to, to, to grow and to be replicated. Um, I suppose that would be a removal of the supports for the industrial model would automatically uh, make more, uh, I suppose, funding and capacity there for the production to be focused on food, providing food for people uh, and on regenerating the, those ecosystems which have been so badly eroded by the, by the industrial production model. The second area is perhaps more complex because it requires us to look, I mean, the, the, the labor and livelihoods and the global trade and, and solidarity, that makes us look beyond our own local areas, beyond our local borders, um, and to begin to think about how we can change structures and decisions which exist outside our locality and our direct area. And I think it's there where international solidarity and organizing can become uh, important and take a primary role. Um, I mean, I think social movements have become more atomized, more focused on particular uh, campaigns. And I think we've maybe lost that kind of shared European international spaces where it used to be an articulation of kind of, of, of citizens' movements. Um, and I think we need to be building those more than ever. So perhaps that's something that we can think about how we can build international, regional solidarity, interregional solidarity and cooperation. Um, and I think in some ways I was thinking about it, the great slogan of the ultra globalization movement was, you know, to think low, think, sorry, act. think global and act local. But I mean, maybe we need to invert it a little bit. I and mean, if we are thinking local, we know there are times where we need to act local and uh, act globally, sorry, to kind of confront uh, the power of those, I suppose, transnational agribusiness corporations who are working with technology companies and other, other, other big, uh, big vested interests. So, 
that's just something else. I suppose there's a few other things I thought about that, would be, that aren't really in the paper, which might be worth considering. And I think they're important elements, but I don't know if there's room for them to be reflected on. One thing I think is important is that idea of generational thinking. And uh, I mean, sort of something that goes beyond the sort of short-term thinking, short-term mentality um, that prevents us from making significant changes to our culture over time. And which I suppose is robbing a future generation. And that's something that certainly could be said of, of, of the problems we face with climate change. And it's particularly useful to think about that when we're talking about land use and farming systems, because they can be slow to change, and uh, we sometimes need long-term plans um, that go beyond our own sort of time frame to, to make those changes. I think reclaiming that kind of intergenerational approach might help us to regenerate parts of our culture which have been lost or have been removed and replaced with kind of consumerism. Uh, so it's perhaps worth thinking about that. The second one is just on governance level uh, in terms of getting local governments and municipalities to take effective measures. Um, and on the ground, and I think there's there's a lot of capacity there, and it's perhaps a it's a it's a fault of the actual structure of governance itself, the, of the top down decision making of representative, you know, electoral systems, and I think the, the idea of that dem democratic confederalism is an interesting one for us to think about here, um, where you have uh, kind of public popular assemblies, and in, in Ireland we had a very successful example of the citizens assemblies, which led to two referenda. Um, and I mean, essentially, they would be there to define policy and dictate direction, and you would directly elect officials to enact those policies. Um, and it's just it's, a, it's another idea way of thinking about local governance, which I think is something as well. And it goes into the kind of systemic changes that we need to see in order to kind of develop the kind of uh, changes that we want. So, I mean, it's just something that's worth considering. And I suppose connected to that is that idea of community wealth building, and that would be people might be familiar, but where the same authorities and municipalities look at local anchor institutions and uh, which have large public procurement budgets and seeing how they can develop procurement policies. I mean, I can leave it there, Davey, if that's all right. Anyway, time. Yeah, well, we, we, we'll have five minutes or so to capture any reflections or questions that people have. Uh, it's more useful insights. And if you write them in the chat, we can actually harvest them into our documents. Uh, and work with them. Uh, if you want to put your hand up, you can do that in reactions. Um, but I suppose what we're really trying to do here is practice food sovereignty, enable the practice of food sovereignty, how we uh, produce our food in a regenerative way, think about our soils, think about restoring ecosystems, thinking about the livelihood potential of diversification uh, and uh, the potential for stronger local economies. Uh, and also then to do that, to look at the last pillar, as I see it in food sovereignty, the actually taking autonomy over the distribution networks so that we can grow, transform and distribute in our regions and local economies in a way that builds that resilience as well as reducing our carbon footprint. We focus less on our carbon footprint here, uh, but we, we can see that this uh, idea or this lens of food sovereignty gives us a way to take climate action, uh, but also at the same time to build that capacity to cope with the challenges that we're going to face over the next number of years. So does anyone want to come in uh, or add anything? Mario Higgins says in the chat, super local, local to global planning. So what Fargo was saying there, like uh, think uh, and act globally, uh, but really embed and root ourselves locally, uh, engaging in that uh, process uh, that we're describing in this section. We are going to move now into a reflection uh, from Europe, a response um, from Morgan Audi. Morgan is a farmer and a member of the coordinating committee of the European Via Campesina. And um, so you're very welcome, Morgan. We'll start with the blockers. So what is the, the, the things that are stopping us make these changes? So what are you seeing as, as preventing the changes we need to see? Well, at ECVC, we say very clearly that what we want is more farmers in Europe. And the main obstacle for a relocalization of food production and a transition towards agroecology is the constant push towards lower agricultural prices. And low agricultural prices force farmers to grow bigger in order to produce more and thus compensate lower prices by larger volumes. 
It also makes it impossible for farmers to move towards more agroecology because most of the destructive agricultural practices aim at lowering production costs. This is the case for pesticides, for example. We all know that it is possible to produce without pesticides, as all organic farmers do. Yet, it is impossible to be competitive without pesticides on global markets. And so you will tell me, yes, but some farmers do succeed in going more agroecological, even in this context. Yes, this is true, but only some, because we develop a strategy of market niche. This is my case as an organic farmer selling on short supply chain. I can sell my products to a much higher price than if I had to sell conventional vegetables to supermarkets. Yet, as the organic production grows and gets more integrated within both big corporation framework, the prices of even of organic food are pushed down. In the same way, with COVID, big, or big organic producers have started to sell vegetables, organic vegetables, on local markets, taking all prices down. What I want to say is that we, the small farmers, we are looking for strategies to try to survive. And thus, we move to organic farming. I, I am also involved in a, in a CSA scheme, and it is important to secure my revenue. But all these are a niche, market niche, which, which also little by little are taken by big corporations, which are starting to move to veggie boxes on, uh, on organic production. So we should be very clear uh, when we speak to each other that all local alternatives, they are very much ne uh, a necessity for us to survive. Yet it is not equal with our project for the world society. Because if all my neighbors were moving to organic production and to a short supply chain, the prices would go down and we would all die. So we need to go further in our, in our thinking. There are two important factors that drive decrease in agricultural prices and take the value away from the farmers and redirect the value towards big corporations. The first one is technology. Bigger tractors, drones, digitalization. The main goal of the vast majority of technologies is to reach more productivity. Uh, so farmers get indebted to buy high-tech tools, and then they need to grow much bigger to produce more and to produce also more specialized product. Because if I buy a machine to plant salad, I will need to plant only salad, and I won't, it, it will not be possible for me to grow carrots anymore. I will need to be more specialized. So it, it is a very important uh, incentive that we don't take enough into account very, very often. Um, and the other uh, important factor that drives prices down is free trade. Uh, competition with corporations from all over the world with different standards at social and environmental level is, is a major threat for small-scale farmers all over the world. And this is what food sovereignty is tackling. Um, the lower standards a corporation has to deal with, the more competitive it will be on global markets. So free trade is really an important incentive to lower both social and environmental standards. Uh, and this is true both at international level, but also within the EU. And it is an important factor, the, the intra-EU trade, because we see a very strong specialization also within the EU with some countries with high capitalization, lots of machines, for example, spe specializing in dairy production with huge uh, uh, productivity uh, through machines. And for example, uh, Spain has lost all, uh, many um, dairy producers. But for uh, fruits and vegetables, where you need lots of labor, in France, we've lost 
of the production over the last 30 years. It all moved uh, to Spain, Italy, and then also to Morocco, where they have lower uh, social standards. So it's a war of all of us against all of us. And this is really what we need to, to, to stop. And this is really what food sovereignty is about. Yes, and then uh, I, I will speak about the, the more yeah, what let's we can do. That. Let's <laughs> come to the positives, but let's capture what we just said there. So it's the high cost of low price. The, the prices have been driven down with the globalization and the commodification of food. Um, but we do uh, see with uh, the need for carbon reduction and a different approach to agriculture as we introduce the circular economy, as we learn to live within the Earth's carrying capacity, that this way of agriculture and our food economy is completely unsustainable. So we know that, that is, is, this is, uh, we're, we're, we're moving towards uh, transformation, which I think we're capturing with looking at regenerative agriculture and community supported agriculture and, and that sort of embedded food system into localities. Uh, but what are you seeing that might accelerate change? What are you seeing, Morgan, that's happening on the ground that might be the, the green shoots of something uh, new, of a new agricultural and food system? Uh, well, so this is more on, on, the, on the alternative. Of course, all, all the local alternatives, they are very much needed and on, on, on welcome. But we really need to tackle the issue of low price. And here we, 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 have, we have something which is complicated because on one end, we see, um, we see a really great part of the people in our societies which, who, who, are, who, are, who have economical difficulties. Who, are, who, who face growing precarity, and and um, and so there is a kind of opposition to uh, between the farmers who need higher agricultural prices, and uh, let's say the people, the poor people in our society, uh, who need to to get food at lower prices, and we believe that we need really to to tackle this. Um, this uh, contradiction, because for us, it's, it's not a real contradiction. The problem is that food has become a, a, a commodity, while we, we do believe that we could go for a more collective approach towards access to healthy and, uh, and good food and local food. So paint a picture of that, Morgan. Tell us a story of what you're seeing from that perspective. So one idea concerning that, is the food social security. It's to do the same as what we do for, um, for health, where of course, all the people will contribute to the health social system, but then you will receive according to what you need. If you are healthy, you won't receive, but if you are, if you are sick or ill, you will receive uh, health uh, treatment, uh, not depending on what you spent as contributions. And we believe that this is a very interesting uh, solution if we want to tackle uh, the, the issue of access to, to healthy food, is pay social contribution uh, depending on, on each person's revenue, but receive the food on an equal basis. Uh, the, the project that we try to develop at the French level is to, receive, to have around 150 euro per month uh, and per, per person. And then the third pillar of this proposal is local collective decision making. This is to have farmers who are part of this uh, framework uh, who have to, to, to reach some of the, of the requirements decided at the local level, but ma really make the food not a commodity, not a commodity anymore, but really something which is based on the, on the local decision, what we decide to, together and make it really democratic in a sense that it's not only the wealthiest people in the society who can afford the local healthy organic food, but that really we are on an equal footing uh, um, because th this is a criticize that is often made that only the rich people can buy organic local food. And we need to tackle this issue. We need to say, okay, how, how do we make sure that really the, the, the less wealthy people in the society can reach uh, uh, the food that we, we produce at the local level. 
And for this, we need a more collective contribution to reach better revenue for the farmers and access for, to a healthy food for even the poor people in the society. So that is one of the one of the proposals that really I think it, it's very far from being completed and, and from from being able to reach it. But I think that it helps us to to think really forward on what we really want um, for for a more equal society, more a fairer society, and a more ecological society. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a new culture. I mean, it's an emerging culture that we're seeing that um, really value food. Uh, value seasonal eating, value um, supporting your local food producers mm -hmm. and be even part of that local food economy or those local food webs that will bring resilience and allow us to take action uh, to address the climate and ecological emergency. So I think there's a number of things coming together now uh, around this framing of food sovereignty. Uh, Morgan, thanks so much for, for joining us and sharing your reflections. Uh, that was uh, very useful and uh, and uh, stay with us uh, we'll, we'll, thanks we'll, a lot thank you so we are going to um, now look at what citizens and communities can do so we we're going to have three short stories uh, first um, from Susie Can who I uh, have worked with over the last 15 years on um, different aspects of uh, sustainability transition towns permaculture uh, but Susie's recently um, just joined the Climate Justice Centre at TASC. Uh, so she's now really involved in this people's transition, which I'm going, we're going to have a conversation around. But Susie has her own permaculture training project called Karadura, and she's a member of Ecolease.eu, which is a meta network of community supported or community engaged initiatives for sustainability and uh, and climate action. Uh, Susie, you're very welcome. Thanks, Davey. Um, very nice to be here. And um, yeah, I think to give you a little bridging from where I, what I'm going to bring in in this story about the people's transition work that, as you say, I'm only recently engaged with, with tasks, um, also quite new climate justice center. Mm -hmm. um, is that one of the things of being, you know, at the, uh, very like empathetic and and, and very uh, relating to Fergal and to Mor Morgan talking about that producer level, having run, you know, both courses, but also being a producer, trying to run CSAs, trying to do work at community level. I think that one of the things I was always looking for, um, as many of the things that we involve ourselves in at community level are voluntary and we're doing community led development and it's um, it were brokers that would be somewhere um, that we could impact and and make changes in policy and how kind of that could um, how that could arise so that's kind of a little bit of a bridge as to why when I saw Sean's work on the People's Transition Report um, that was published last November, I kind of was keeping an eye on this work because mm. it looked like it was a potential exciting leverage point. Sean went around, he spoke to lots of initiatives on the ground. He spoke, I'm sure, to several people that might be on this call. Mm -hmm. um, he spent, I think, about six weeks in the camper van. But he also really reached out and spoke to, I think he just rocked up in people's farmyards and spoke to what we might call conventional farmers. Um, and that out of that, and out of research, and, and it was through um, the, uh, another European foundation, work that they created the people's transition report was this idea that at the base of the of the, of it is that at the core of the work i guess is the recognition that if communities have all this valuable local knowledge part of that that i've been listening to in part of for probably 20 or more years um that although people want to, if you talk to someone, you can go to the value place where people do want to protect things for future generations, They, but they also want to address their very real and immediate concerns in their lives. 
And that, that, I mean, I think you kind of touched on it just now, like the dairy farmer that's in debt for his machinery, like whatever it is. And so- Are you up on the booth, Nora? <laughs> got some people on- on uh, second. On muting. One second, let's find this. Uh, <laughs> for some reason, there's some people I can't mute. Uh, so I, if you, if you are on your sweetie, you're not muted. So I'm muting you now. <laughs> not your fault uh, but if everyone could just mind themselves with the mute sorry Susie and um, back to the people's transition so the idea was to take uh, this report and say okay here's all these learnings about how um, what you know how that participatory model how that idea of local collective decision making that deeper participation and collaboration how could that um, work in a pilot form in Ireland with communities. And the idea really is so is that if, if it is something that climate actions can meet and address the needs and can be part of a dialogue, can be co-owned, all that community wealth building, then the outcome of that would be the communities are actually demanding climate action because it's solving their real and current issues. Maybe and there's something to capture there, Susie. Yeah. You mentioned it briefly there, community wealth building. And I think it's something that uh, the task paper, People's Transition, really brings in as uh, part of the response that we can make. Maybe just, if you can quickly, what, what is that local wealth building, community wealth building? Sure. I mean, I guess, you know, like sometimes it's like when you're trying to talk about something like climate justice or just transition, it's quite useful to talk about the opposites. And I think people have already. So, I mean, the opposite of community wealth building, and then I'll talk about what it is, is if governments privatize climate action, use those public monies that are coming, we're about to see the biggest stimulus package you know, that Ireland has seen probably since its foundation as a state um, coming in for climate action through EU, through all of our usual mechanisms, through the Green Deal. And if governments, you know, privatise that um, investment, take that public money, then that's not community wealth building, right? That's the old model of extractive wealth into private hands, into multinationals. Um, and, and when, you know, when that those multinationals pull out of communities because they do and we know that that post-industrialization then everybody gets left in those precarious maybe service jobs in in often in caring you know i've just spent one of the pilots that we're piloting this approach is, is in ardara as it really is a a, a community that um, has all of the issues that you would find in any western seaboard rural community with issues in terms of the farming community, the fishing community, and the Port Namona peat bogs that, that closed 10 years ago and so on. So what community wealth building is about is a number of different things, but Fergal mentioned one of them, which is participatory budgeting, saying here comes this money, you know, can we have our own development plan for our, you know, and can we have the local institutions be part of that wanting to support us can we have uh you know the money that comes in through in ireland the leader programs the money that comes in through you know smaller amounts through the county councils but you know can we have a say in that so that's part of it is participating in the actual spending but another way to think about community wealth building is and there's a fantastic uh example it took them five years um in the community of fintry in um, scotland where you have you know a, a development company coming in wanting to bring in an energy company like a windmills which we know you know cause huge uh, resistance across ireland's landscape because none it's all of the burdens and none of the benefits of a new investment a climate action a transition action an action to a new kind of energy form but all of that is just a burden comes to the local community and none of the benefits in Fintry as a community pushed back with the developer and you know they ended up the very small village and they ended up oh it took them five years to get a profit sharing model to get a mortgage on an extra windmill to end up there's great it's called the winds of change if you want to see how that community engaged but eventually that's meaning that they're getting a 15 percent return on that it directly into the community currently that is about um i think it's like 30 to 50 000 sterling 
budget that the community has to address other needs in the community, food poverty, fuel poverty, whatever other needs are, are there for those that aren't enabled because the money is extracted um, to do things. And you can see all the stuff they're doing with it in their community. That figure is going to go up yeah. when they pay off the mortgage on the windmill they put in. It's actually going to be 400,000 per mm. annum into a small community. And, you know, they have complete community wealth ownership. Now, that's just a profit sharing. But what if we, you know, the, the community um, supply and uh, distribution, what, what you know, of, of food, whatever else it is that is a, a viable climate action that can be fully and, you know, cooperatively owned, um, then you know that the, the you know wealth circulates within the community. And yeah, the it's community like an has easy bucket. You're keeping the wealth look yeah. in the region, in the locality. Yeah, funny enough, I, that leaky bucket was a metaphor that you used a long time ago, Davy, in the Pardon, and I find myself using it again recently a lot. Yeah, there's work um, that Vasta and New Economics Foundation did around local economies and the need for local exchange mechanisms or local currencies. But just yeah. to finish, uh, Susie, in the two pilots you're doing in Donegal and Dublin with the People's Transition, uh, is there a focus? Is there a way you're bringing in agricultural and food? So one of the things that we're doing is rather than arriving with solutions, we are doing that like really deep community consultation and listening phase exactly, yeah. because it's very easy to come in with a repetition of a top down solution, you know, and say, here we are, we've got this one and it, it hasn't responded to or addressed, you know, the needs. And I think that's a critical factor because it's part of what pits you know, so-called environmentalists against farmers or anyone in the community would say, like, we have these burdens. Are you, you know, you hear that response of like, are you going to pay off my machinery? Are you going to put my, you know, like that. So we're we're starting from a listening um, and consultation space. And also the other part of that is that communities may not have within them the expertise. There's lots, I, I have a huge belief in the community as what the community does have, because that's where mm -hmm. I've chosen to make my life's work is at the community level. But, yeah. you know, we are dealing with, um, like if you wanted to set up a new cooperative, I've seen some amazing examples mm -hmm. around the world that I've been exploring and looking at, you know, Urban A's big um, database and knowledge commons, but you need at some point to bring experts that say, well, this climate solution is viable in your locale because of these reasons and it does address those two key, two key priorities that you identified in your consultation and then you still go into co-creation and participation about like one of the tracks that we have is a decision makers or politicians track where we're engaging you know very much with the local development companies and the local politicians at local and national level because we want them to be the drivers but it, it you know it helps if your community has told you all of their needs and priorities and it's not that the climate action that gets proposed is going to address all of those but if people can see you know the dots joined back to that conversation that we had about you know essentially why people are not living the quality of life mm -hmm. that they could achieve why they're living the life you know it, like it's a capabilities approach to, to development that says like, what is it that are the opportunities? Why, why are people not living the life? And could we expand those capabilities at a local level? Because then you, you know, I mean, I, I got to speak to people whose lives got derailed because of yeah. changes in industries, changes in, in, you know, things that happened and where, you know, where they couldn't find that new capability. So I guess that's the important thing is to actually start, if we mean participation, if we say those words that we want it to be participatory, you can't start with, you know, what the action's gonna be at the beginning. So um, your, your approach is in your prototypes and in the people's transition model is to listen deeply to that community, to look for what's strong, not what's, for, what's wrong, and then build on that to the actions and the initiatives. It's, it's both and, I would say. It's both and, you know. So, yes, it's opportunities and strength. And we, you know, in Donegal, in Ardara, we've been talking about, you know, the older industries and, you know, what derailed them and the wool industries and, you know, how, what the, where the sheep's wool used to go, where it goes now, where it doesn't go now. Yeah. So, you know, we are talking about those complex um, pieces, but also 
people's needs and priorities now, like why people cannot get housing, not just in Fribsborough, where you would expect people have issues with housing, but why people cannot get housing in Ardera, you know, why the young people were not going to come back until their 30s. And if they do come back, they still think it's going to be a challenge. You know, so we're talking about out migration, we're talking about, and these are somewhat obvious um, if you've spent time looking at rural Ireland and looking at these challenges, but we're really drilling down and speaking to key um, you know, consultations, key rapporteurs to get the real stories behind that to say, yeah, I'm a woman who spent my life doing this and then this happened and then that happened. And and now we're at, in Ardara, we've just completing the, the listening phase with a survey of kind of saying, so do you, you know, this is what you said, do you agree? Yeah. And we're moving on to doing the same phase in Fibsborough. So, so it's like a it's, form of listening. Brilliant. It is, but wherever we hope to get to. So lastly, just that last pit is that if this works and this is, you know, discovery phase, if you like, if this as approach works, if you get, you know, those two communities and then we go and look, we're already getting inquiries from other communities that want this brokering, want us to help talk to, you know, the experts in UCD or in somewhere else. Um, if we get that working and these solutions are actionable and they are funded and so on and we start that wealth capture happening then hopefully you get another 20 and hopefully you keep going and then as i say the out the end is that communities are demanding climate action because it is a driver and the opposite of that is communities resisting it and we know that that in populist movements in protest movements you know we know where that could go yeah. and that's so I suppose where it's bridged me out of maybe my comfort bubble okay, in I, I, communities I that to, I already get it. Yeah. That's it. That's so it. that's Don't ideal. Be... And I think the people's transition is a model of engagement. If we don't uh, listen and engage our communities, uh, we're not going to have an inclusive uh, transition. Uh, there'll just be no transition, never mind a just transition. So thanks, Susie. Good luck with the work uh, with task there. So we're going to keep moving with another local story. We've got my colleague Oliver Moore. Uh, Oliver's a, a lecturer in UCC at the Cooperative uh, Centre for Cooperative Studies and the chief communicator at ART 2020, which is uh, uh, looking at organics and rural regeneration across Europe. And he's also also the chair of Clock Jordan Community Farm. So welcome, Ollie. Hi, David. So Ollie, uh, maybe just from this idea of practicing food sovereignty, which you probably can see quite actively in Clock Jordan, maybe maybe we'll start there. What what can we see? Uh, how do we? How does this transition to low carbon and resilient society? Um, be, how is it seen in in where you are? Yeah, so basically, Clotrodden Community Farm is uh, in, it's on the land of Clotrodden Eco Village, which is 67 acres in the middle of Clotrodden Town, really. Clotrodden Town is in the Midlands in Ireland. So there's lots of elements here locally that we engage with as a firm as well, uh, which I can tell you about first, which do involve elements of food sovereignty and, and local resilience. So we have um, a bakery, we have an egg club, we have a mushroom club. Um, we have allotments, we have, you know, an, an eco-village that has elements of um, living and working and recreating and livelihoods kind of all together, but then also on the main, on the main town itself um, of Clot Jordan, there is a community cafe as well, which takes lots of our produce as well, um, takes extra produce from the farm. Um, so there is sort of an ecosystem of sort of innovations that are related to food sovereignty because these initiatives, like from the bakery to the egg club to the buyers club actually as well for, um, for Whole Foods, they involve people coming together to make arrangements with each other, to make collective decisions together, to make longer term arrangements, to commit to, you know, paying each other for various aspects of, of you know, food that's produced in an agroecological way, so for example. So the farm itself then um, is uh, three hectares, which isn't a huge amount, but it's three hectares of vegetable, of mixed vegetable production done agroecologically. So that's very much sort of uh, food sovereignty and food resilience approach because, you know, we're producing it um, right beside where we're consuming it. We have a wide variety of things that we're producing. We're also using rotations and cover crops and we're using sort of non-industrial interventions, basically. So it's not industrial processes and it's not industrial inputs. It's natural and human inputs. So we have two farmers employed on kind of one and a half labor units equivalent. 
Uh, we have up to 10 people that we train each year then as well through um, the ESC, the European Solidarity Corps, which also ties into that kind of longer distance solidarity that, that Jenna will be talking about later as well, that, you know, we, we connect up with young people around Europe and, and help them live and learn in an eco-village for a year on a farm where they learn, they learn how to be agroecological producers. So, you know, the membership is very engaged as well. So, you know, there's 80 families being fed a large proportion of their vegetables and some of their fruits for the year from the farm. But we have, as soon as you talked about participating, participatory budgeting. So that is how we operate as well. So it's a member owned and operated CSA. Not every community supports agriculture initiative is the same. Um, some are farmer driven, some are consumer driven. Uh, ours is member owned and operated, so we can hire the farmers who then become part of the community. So, you know, the members, you know, give input constantly on what should be done. We have quarterly meetings, we do have participatory budgeting, you know, we set the amount we charge ourselves for the food, and then we have kind of a long term approach to how we manage the soil. So, one third of the land is in green manures or cover crops at any one time so we're not like you know trashing the land to produce food we're we're thinking longer term about land management and space management putting in more and more agroecological elements as well like sort of micro pods for growing in you know extra you know fruiting bushes um and a, a huge variety of, of vegetable production so it's not so monocultural as well there could be up to 50 different types of veg in a in a given year so there's a lot of elements. Oli, Oli, maybe maybe you could just say a little bit more about the solidarity elements beyond the CSA. So the, the community supported agriculture is about 85 subscribers, but there's probably a number of other clubs that you directly link with, right? Yeah, so as a an eater in this town, I can get um, raw organic milk from a micro dairy uh, up the road. I can also access the bread once a month, sorry, once a week or twice a week even, uh, from a bakery on site in Dika Village using um, sourdough techniques and trialing as much as possible to, to grow um, the cereals locally. Um, that's a lot of work in Ireland, but it's still it's being done. So there's also a mushroom club, an egg club. Um, there's a buyer's club for wholesale, collective wholesale purchases. Um, there's the local cafe then as well, and then, which is a co-op, um, there's allotments and there's some larger sort of the largest growers in the allotments also do meals sometimes and have extra surplus to sell. And we're also then setting up a, um, a distribution, uh, an, an online farmer's market here as well, which will be useful for extra distribution from the farm where we have those extra needs. We can also grow to service that open food network um, market. But likewise, all of those people I mentioned, all those producers, also there's an apple club, or so there's a apple juice producers as well. Um, they'll also be able to sell through this um, open food network. So like every major food group can be covered um, regionally, very locally within sort of five miles. And they'll be able to sell now, hopefully, through this um, open food network as well. So I think I think what's really important there is that this isn't just shortening supply chains, which is doing, which reduces our ecological impacts or the ethics of where our, our food is produced and the relationship with the food producers. But it's actually doing a lot more than that, is building uh, a, a route to market, a potential uh, ability to diversify, that everyone becomes producers and consumers, prosumers, in food webs rather than just short uh, supply chains. So, Yeah, and you can see lots of little sort of micro niches emerging as well from people who do grow their own veg, start to become, you know, plant sellers, people then doing tinctures, doing herbalism courses, all of these things to build up from just increasing the capacity of people to grow and to, you know, operate in a resilient manner. Brilliant, Ollie. So um, that's uh, Ollie talking about what's happening in Clock Jordan. Clock Jordan Community Farm.ie is the website of the community farm, the largest CSA, uh, which is a network of about 10 different community supported agriculture projects. Thanks, Ollie. And uh, we're going to have one little short story from uh, the locality. Uh, Jennifer, Jen O'Connor, Jennifer O'Connell, McConnell, sorry, Jen, uh, is a food sovereignty researcher. Uh, she was the former uh, CEO or manager, general manager of Irish Seed Savers, and is someone that has worked with us uh, 
on and off over the years. So Jen, you're, you're very welcome. Thank you very much, David, uh, David Richard. Yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Philip, David, uh, thanks for joining us, Jen. So really yeah, it's thanks. a simple question. In the sort of framing of practicing food sovereignty, why is seed sovereignty important? So, well, first off, thanks very much for the opportunity to be here and nice to meet you all and hear all of your stories. Really, without seed, there is no food. So if you actually consider all of the, the sources of your food, whether it's local, whether it's imported, most of that food with regard to plant material is actually requires seed for it to grow. So when we actually look at seed, um, you know, we, a lot of the times if you actually look you'll see a lot of the seed is actually imported so over 95 percent of the seeds to grow food in this country is actually imported there isn't really a strong focus by the government to ensure that we have local seed production and the thinking really is, is because of the weather and the climate here in ireland that we don't really have a viable market to grow our own seed however with the likes of irish seed savers that i was involved with brown envelope seeds true harvest seeds up in the north with eco seeds and the herb garden like there's only five seed producers in ireland but yet there's a huge need given of our, I suppose, our reliance on agriculture. Um, and also the same then goes for um, feed for animals as well, that, you know, a lot of the seed for that is actually imported. So seed sovereignty really is about protecting our ability to control from where our seed comes, which then ensures that we have a control on where our food comes from, but also the autonomy and the power to understand our seed. So while there's great opportunities for plant breeding, for seed breeding as well, that it's to really understand that throughout a whole food cycle, none of it can really start unless we actually have full control over our own seed. With regard to seed sovereignty, seed itself is one of the most heavily regulated items in the world. You have, um, obviously with the likes of Monsanto, Bayer, a lot of work on GMO, there's real control over seed. And so it actually brings huge hardship on farmers throughout the world where, especially in hardship countries, developing countries where there is an element of force that's actually been put onto the farmers to actually grow seed from industrial um, organizations so that they can actually bring in money. However, it means that they cannot save their own seed. It also ensures that the seed itself is patented and it therefore means that the seed is owned. Now seed shouldn't actually be owned. There is a lot of work that's done with regard to plant genetic resources, which is our plant and seed material. So there's a lot of work in terms of conservation and most countries in the world will sign up to what's called the International Plant Treaty. So if you're interested in learning more about this, you can go to the FAO, which is the Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations. You can go to FAO.org and you'll see a lot of work, especially this year, this is the International Year of Fruit and Vegetables. So there's a lot of focus now in terms of conservation, what we're actually doing to research and protect seed, but also to ensure that we're protecting farmers to be able to grow their own food, grow their own seed, and then save seed. However, with EU legislation, there is a restriction on, on sharing seed. So it's concerned, it's actually discussed about marketing seed, which is about the selling of seed itself. In uh, the likes of Irish seed savers, we fall under the element of heritage seeds. So a lot of our seed is either native to Ireland or heritage in that it's come from other places, but is adapted to our environment over the years. So it's been grown year on year and protected. Those seeds are allowed to be shared because we're trying to actually protect and conserve these collections. So by other people getting these seed and growing them in their own gardens, communities and farms, it is actually protecting the, uh, the collections themselves. There's also another element within EU regulation that allows for very small packets, so amateur packets for hobby gardeners to actually be sold. However, we're not allowed actually within, within Ireland and within Europe, you're not actually allowed to sell on a bulk scale to commercial growers. So therefore it means that you're also always getting your seed from kind of bigger corporations. However, one of the things um, that should be um, focused on with regard to seed as well is that there are different types of seeds. So why do commercial growers grow certain type of seeds compared to hobby gardeners? So you have the likes of you have the genetically modified uh, seed. And, um, you know, there's if you look back on the years with regard to is it Walter Borlock, um, who had started work on the dwarf wheat. And that, in a sense, was originally to look at um, addressing famine and actually food poverty. However, that is now then developed and it's become about a control about food, control about seed. 
You also then have um, hybridized seed. Now, there's nothing wrong with that seed, but it's basically bred so that it is distinct, uniform and stable. So that when commercial growers are growing their the seed, that they know that all of their crop is going to be uniform. And that's because that's what the demand is on the market. People don't shy away from the ugly veg or, you know, if something looks a little bit different to what they expect it to look like. Then you have open pollinated seed. And the open pollinated seed is true to the parent type. It means that you can actually grow from that seed you can save from that seed however there's another bit of science behind that which unfortunately you'll have a lot of people might say oh I'm, I'm saving my seed but you need to grow you know a, a vast number of plants to actually ensure that you're protecting the genetic diversity of the seed so there's a lot of focus that really needs to be given an education on seed so you have the likes of the Gaia Foundation's uh, UK and Ireland Seed Sovereignty Programme you've also got the Let's Liberate Diversity which is a European seed network I was involved with them for the last couple of years and there's various organizations around especially La Via Campesina as well in terms of protecting farmers rights but people's right to access seed so seed sovereignty is vital because without that we don't have food sovereignty itself you're you're muted there Davey <laughs> Thank you. Without seed sovereignty, then we don't have food sovereignty. And without both, we don't have resilient local uh, food economies. So we'll be uh, dependent on externalities and exports. And so thanks, Jen, for, for joining yeah, sorry, us. If there's just one thing I can add on to that as well, just sorry, Davey, um, is just with regard to the fact of if, if many people think back to February 2017, when there was a huge shortage of vegetables on yeah. supermarket shelves, a lot of this also comes down to supply chains, and this is exactly. where the link with regard to trade. But when the, the supermarket shelves were empty of vegetables, people started to kind of say, why are we importing vegetables that we can grow ourselves? And the same goes then for seed. That was 2017. Then there was a lot of focus 2018 and 19 on climate action. What can we do? And a focus on carbon footprint and food miles. But you also need to factor in seed miles. If you're looking at growing locally from where is your seed grown and is it suitable well, for this environment? Yeah, but and then also you then have COVID, which actually you know, the demand for seed was massive. And so it meant then people were starting to panic and bulk buying seed without really understanding what they were going to grow, how the seed could be stored, how long the seed survives. And then the next thing was Brexit. So now with Brexit, most of the seed that has come into Ireland either comes from or through the UK. But yet within Great Britain, a lot of the seed growers there, like the seed co-op, real seeds, they would actually grow a lot of seed, but they also import a lot of seed from Europe. Yeah. Now that supply chain is cut off. So the supply chain into Ireland of seed is really, really low. And so again, this year was a huge panic for people to want to get seed. The main things that need to happen is supporting local seed producers, but also putting pressure on the Department of Agriculture to have a focus on seed production. They're doing a lot of work now on cereal, but they're not doing it on vegetables. And actually vegetables is the majority of what people eat. Sure. So there needs to be much more focus on that. Okay. So really we need to be prepared for our, the vulnerability of the island of Ireland. And in yeah. terms of ensuring yeah. that we actually develop seed production for seed security for the future. Okay, so as well as lobbying, we can actually save some of our own seed as well. So yeah. let's uh, get into the practice uh, as well as the, the lobbying for changes in policies. Thanks, Jen. Uh, always a pleasure. Good luck with your PhD. Okay, so we're going into small groups. We're really trying to identify in each area the blockers, uh, the enablers, and what citizens and uh, communities might do. So in production, in room number one with Fergal, organizing process and distribution, number two with me, uh, livelihoods with Ollie in room three, and trade and solidarity in room four. And we've only got about 15 minutes if we're gonna finish on time. So let's use our time wisely, uh, be listening as much as we're speaking, and we're trying to capture as many blockers and enablers on what we can do. So I'm sending you to the rooms now, Okay, you're all very welcome yes. back. Thanks all for that engagement. I know it was short, but we've managed, I can see in the harvest document, to bring quite a lot in. We'll start with room one in production. Uh, Fergal, that was your room. Do you or someone else want to just feed back quickly? Maura, are you, yeah, you good with that, Maura? Yeah, okay. Um, we, one, of the key things, one of the key things we came back with was that it's hard to get information 
from the established system. system. Therefore, there's no way in. Um, and the informal information network is very useful. However, this needs to be made tangible. For instance, farmers walks are great as part of the informal space and network, but that needs to be made tangible. Access to resources, training, knowledge is really, really important and support systems are currently not up to scratch. We need to continue communities of practice as best practice models and find some way of systemizing those. Uh, and um, I think that is the, the main thing that came out of ours, Fergal. Uh, strong Euro in some European countries, they're doing this and doing it well. So there's good models to look to um, and uh, emphasis on um, education, education, the younger generations came up. In Romania, the permaculture is uh, looking at this already. Perfect, Mary. That was absolutely brilliant. Uh, I was in the livelihoods room. We had quite a, a quick and rapid uh, conversation. And uh, maybe some of the, the key ones that came up for us in thinking about adding value and distributing locally is the sort of business as usual, extracting value to the global economy from our local economy and uh, um, the bureaucracy and health and safety that we're wrapped up in. Some enablers were looking at things like some appropriate scale technologies. And uh, there was, um, Pater mentioned the the, the super value food academy. So there is some things that might be interesting, but an interesting one was a shorter working week, giving more people time to grow food and distribute food. So that was good. Ollie, you were doing livelihoods. Are you or someone else? Just give us an insight into what were, was discussed there. Sure, yeah, we um, didn't assign anybody else to speak, but I'll start maybe and if somebody else wants to jump in, because I, I did take some notes into the doc. So, we, we did have a bit of a farmer focus um, on this, um, not exclusively about livelihoods, but um, the blockers, I suppose, were institutional and funding cap related blockers, which forced people at all ends of the spectrum into sort of a conventional um, reality. So the, um, the funding rules and paperwork rules kind of shackle farmers and force them into a path dependency where they're either they've got buildings and and borrowings to service or they have to keep certain basic things going such as uh, an inappropriate stocking rate or animal range even for upland areas and so on so there were those are some of the kind of blockers um but for and succession planning as well um enablers though more listening was an interesting um point uh, more listening to farmers and food producers EIPs have been an, an enabler for farmers to explore new different ways, that's the European Innovation Partnership, for farmers to explore new ways to diversify and broaden out what they do. But as a, as a specific enabler, uh, micro dairy and enabling local markets and similar to micro dairy is maybe a new way for farmers in that sector to look at profitability and viability that maybe it is possible to for at least a certain number of, of farmers and food producers to generate livelihoods through diversification through more complicated um, means such as just downscaling and supplying local markets from a smaller number of cattle but directly from a smaller okay. number of cows but directly brilliant ollie that was great so one more quickly the trade and solidarity room that was you jen uh, a quick feedback or insight from that? Yeah, room. thanks very much. Yeah, we had a, a very interesting conversation that could have gone on for a lot longer. Um, some of the key things, like in terms of just understanding what the trade deals are, why we actually import what we import, why we export what we export. And again, on the back of that, if we're, in, if we're agreeing to export something, what are we agreeing to import instead? And if we change that, then how does that impact other elements of things that we might be agreeing to, like technology, data, other you know raw materials and um, some uh, enablers would be in terms of looking at a local policy versus an international policy so not actually having it as one and the same also looking at uh, the wto and free trade how we could actually have a binding social treaty on food sovereignty so not everything has to get approved by the wto but then also then again looking at what's currently in place why is that in place what can be done to improve on it and what can be done to then really develop food sovereignty in Ireland and then looking at cer certain things like blockers like personal choice why do we like go into a supermarket and see that something is 50p and it's five euro in the farmer's market but we'll go to the 50p because it's we've kind of become that quite convenience culture so how can we actually really 
it, connect more with our food, connect more with what we buy, where we buy it from, what, what are the supply chains, but then also to understand the corporate interest in food and the development of food, but also then the, the foreign aid interest in terms of why we export cer certain things to countries that are then effectively eradicating their own food industries and then removing food sovereignty from others. So it's that kind of personal choice, personal action and impact and outcomes then. Jen, thank you, um, very comprehensive. Um, short, sorry for being so quick, but we have reached the end of our session and I don't want us to um, eat into any more of your time. So thank you everyone for attending this session. What's happening next is we're gonna take everything harvested. If there's any insights or uh, signposts, put it into the chat. We'll stay open for another 10, 15 minutes just to capture that. But I'm gonna bring this session to a close. So we'll be bringing, uh, we're doing a second webinar in September with Green European Foundation. It'll be in partnership with our partners in Bulgaria around the climate economy um, actions. And we will be bringing and launching this pamphlet on food sovereignty uh, and, and local resilience. I, I just want to remind people that we have this paper we did before that we're building a lot on. It mentions the local wealth building uh, that Susie was talking about with the people's transition. It sort of frames in regenerative economics what we're talking about today. So I just want to thank all of the, the partners and everyone that came today. Thank you so much.